little bit about what we're going to do today. We're going to talk a lot about cooking on Wolf appliances. Um, we'll hit some of the, the, the real high points of uh, not only our uh, gas cookery, but also our, our range and wall ovens. We'll talk a little bit about the convection steam oven. We'll introduce you to Sub-Zero and really what sets Sub-Zero apart in the, uh, in the art of food preservation. And then uh, if you really must, we'll talk about uh, doing dishes and we'll talk about the Kobe dishwasher if you'd like to do that. Doesn't make a very interesting demonstration, but we're certainly happy to talk about it as well. And then any other questions that you might come up with, we're happy to answer those for you. Um, from time to time, you might notice the camera moving. We're trying not to uh, make it a jarring presentation. So hopefully it'll be nice and smooth and you'll be able to see everything. And then last but not least, um, we'll have all your email addresses from registering for the class sometime next week. If you're interested, we'll be sending out recipes that we prepare today. If you're interested in those, um, we'll send those out to you next week so you can uh, try them at home once you get some of these appliances uh, installed. All right. So um, without any further ado, we're going to start off by talking a little bit about what makes Wolf the cooking specialist, how we transfer heat the most effective way possible to make everything that you prepare in your kitchen a delicious result. That's really what our goal is. Um, not to have the most elegant piece or the most modernistic piece, but really to have an appliance that you can use so that everything you prepare in your kitchen will come out delicious every single time. As we like to say, we want you to be able to predict delicious results each time. So we're going to talk about three of the four major ways that Wolf appliances transfer heat. And that's really what cooking is all about, is how well and how efficiently and how precisely we transfer heat from the appliance to the cook cookware and then ultimately to the food and give us the, the results that we would like. So those four different methods um, we're going to talk about a little bit today. We're going to demonstrate three. We'll talk about four. Um, so those three methods are our dual convection systems. And that's going to be found in all of our M and E series wall ovens in addition to the range ovens in our dual fuel or our all gas um, uh, line of ranges. So we're going to talk a lot about that. We'll obviously talk as well about our dual stack burners, our infrared griddle when we're talking about cooking an open flame. That's we'll give a nice demonstration of that as well. And then the last demonstration we'll do, we'll be talking about our convection steam oven and how that can really change your life in the kitchen and all the advantages that cooking with steam in conjunction with a convection oven can really, really bring to you. Now, the last method is induction cooking. Um, we won't be demonstrating that today, but should anybody have questions about cooking with induction, we're happy to answer those for you. And if you do come into the showroom, we're happy to provide a demonstration of induction cooking. If you would like to see the Wolf induction cookware, uh, cook, cooktops or cook rain, ranges in action when you're here. So let's start and talk a little bit about what makes dual convection and Wolf convection cooking so superior. Remember this is that all of our ovens, whether it's a wall oven or a range oven are going to have four elements, heating elements and two fans in each one. And the advantage of those dual fans or dual convection is that we can create a number of different processes in the oven that are at your control, which are designed to cook exactly, uh, cook in a way that's exactly suited to what it is you're preparing. So if you're baking four trays of cookie, we, we have a, a mode for that. You want to roast your Thanksgiving turkey, or perhaps it's your standing rib roast at Christmas. We have modes that are better suited to that. And once you understand what the oven is doing and how it's being utilized, you'll find that everything can come out delicious every single time. So here's a great demonstration of what makes wolf convection superior in so many other ways. We have two trays here. I'll just lift them up and show you. The tray on this side, these are our coconut and apple macaroons, right? Ready to be baked in the oven. And then next to it is a tray of smoked bacon and sliced garlic. Now, most people would never bake these two items simultaneously in the same oven because the great fear is my macaroons end up tasting like bacon or worse yet, they may taste like garlic, right? But Wolf Convection, the way it's designed with those dual fans, right? Creates so much air movement and chaos in the oven cavity that none of the flavors from my garlic and bacon are going to settle on my macaroons and therefore 
my macaroons will taste like apple and coconut and vanilla and all those wonderful flavors without picking up any of the flavor of the bacon or the garlic. And when you think about how we do that is because with those dual fans spinning in the back of the oven, right, we can alternate the air pattern as very, very frequently. So there's never a moment during the process when we're baking with convection or roasting with convection that the air is still. And when the air is still is when flavors can settle on one another, but when it's constantly in motion, we never have that problem. So we're gonna bake these two simultaneously. I've got the oven set at 325 degrees in a convection fan mode. And we're gonna put the cookies down here at the bottom of the oven. We're gonna put the garlic and the bacon up here in the top. And we're just gonna let those go simultaneously. I'm pretty sure that the, uh, the cookies will be done a little bit before the garlic and the bacon have reached that, the, the point of doneness that we're looking for, right? But just understand that all of our convection ovens are designed just like that, whether it's an M-series wall oven or an E-series wall oven or our dual fuel range ovens, all those convection systems are going to be the same. They're gonna give you that broad, broad um, range of cooking modes and methods that allow you to dial in exactly what you wanna do in that oven because of the fact that we have two fans and those four elements that can be used in a numerous number of combinations in order to create the exact type of heat envelope for cooking that item in your, um, in your oven, okay? So there's a little bit about dual convection. Again, it's really um, one of the, the superior ways that we're able to transfer heat um, through wool, okay? So let's talk a little bit about what I like to call is sort of the show or the glamorous part of cooking. When you're here at the range and you're gonna do some sauteing or you're maybe you're gonna, you're gonna make some pasta or you're gonna brown off some chicken breast, whatever it might be, um, there's a, so many different combinations that we can create um, in our gas cook line. And really I feel like gas cookery is where Wolf really sets itself apart from the competition in terms of the amount of control, precision, um, that you, you can get with all of our gas appliances. Um, this is a dual fuel, 48 inch dual fuel range. It has a uh, single griddle here in the middle, our infrared griddle. Um, so we're gonna talk a little bit about cooking on the griddle. We're gonna talk about using this multitude of burners in order to um, achieve some, some great results when we're here in the kitchen, right? And so much of what this is about, right, is about control, right? A lot of people will say, oh, I need the most powerful burner. I need so many BTUs for when I'm cooking in the kitchen because I want all of that power of my control. Problem is that for most people, you give them too much power and they end up burning everything because they just don't know how to control it very well, right? So Wolf gives you that power, right? We have a 20,000 BTU burner here. We have a couple of 18,000 BTU burners. Our griddle is another 18,000 BTUs. So there's a lot of power here. But what's really unique about all the Wolf gas cooktop appliances is what we call our dual stack burner technology. And what that means is essentially on this arrangement where I have six open burners, I really have 12 burners at my disposal because on every single burner that I have in front of me, I essentially have two burners. The top burner, right, is controlled. I'm not sure you'll be able to see it on, on the camera, but right here, there's this single set of gradients. That's your high burner control. So when I turn the burner on, get that back one on, right? We get a nice high flame. We have lots of power. When we want to boil some water or, you know, saute some vegetables, maybe we want to brown some chicken breast, whatever it might be. We have that nice high burner, lots of power, lot, you know, gives us a nice range. But where we really set ourselves apart is that secondary burner. We turn it again, it ignites. And now we have a second set of gradient on the back side of the burner that ignites an entirely separate burner, completely independent gas valve, gas line, the ability to control at a very, very low temperature. So when I want to simmer something, hold a delicate sauce, melt butter, melt chocolate, anytime when I want real control and precision, I have it on every single burner. I don't just have one simmer burner that's dedicated over here. I have six simmer burners all have slightly varying powers so a bigger pot of soup might need to simmer on a different burner than just a pot of butter that i might want to melt i might want to use a smaller burner for that each one is calibrated in terms of strength both 
from that high end to the very lowest end. So an enormous range of control that we have over all of these burners, right? And when I talk about precision, I don't know if there's any better example of real precision cooking when we talk about gas cookware cooking than we get with our infrared griddle. Now, this is an option. You can have it built into any model on a 36 inch or larger of our dual fuel range or our all gas range. Um, you can have either a single griddle or a double griddle. Um, but the beauty of this is we have a single slab of a special alloy steel that was developed by Wolf and Sub-Zero just for use in our infrared griddle. It has an enormous ceramic burner underneath it, which comprises about 85% of the surface area on this griddle, right? Now, what's another advantage of this is it's got a thermostat on it, right? You're not just turning it on and then saying, oh, I think this is the right setting or this is, you know, or maybe it's a little bit lower. It actually can be dialed into the exact temperature that you want to cook with. So if you're going to make pancakes on a Sunday morning, you might find that your pancake recipe works best at 325 degrees, but maybe you want to stir fry some vegetables that evening and you want a little more power. So you'll go up to 450 degrees, but you can dial it in exactly. There's no guesswork. Once you know the temperature you want, you can dial it in. And the beauty of this is that when you're dialed into that temperature, the griddle will hold that temperature without hesitation, without interruption. It'll never cool down. It'll never overheat. So when you want to brown something, you're not going to worry about it burning. And this is where the peace of mind comes in because you can literally start something on the griddle and then step away from it to do another kitchen process without having to worry how this is cooking. Right? So let's just start that with a little bit of demonstration. We're going to do some sea scallops that we've wrapped in a little bit of smoked prosciutto. Right? We're going to just give them a tiny bit of seasoning because that prosciutto is a little bit salty, so we don't want to over season this too much. So just a slight mix of two kinds of pepper and a little bit of kosher salt on our scallops. Now, you can see this is a nicely seasoned griddle. It's really ready to go, just like a cast iron skillet. That's basically how we think of it. But now it has that nice, even temperature, front to back, side to side. Never have to worry about it being a hot spot here or a hot spot there. It's a very even um, amount of heat distribution. So now we're just going to give a little bit of grapeseed oil, but you could use avocado oil, anything that you like. Just want a nice high temperature oil. Probably want to avoid the olive oil on the griddle. Just use a good high temperature sauteing one. We're going to spread it around with our kitchen scraper. Now we're just going to lay these on here. And again, not worrying about where we place them. So we can put four back there. We can put a few more here in the middle. And then we'll just put some down here in front, just so you can see that that heat is so even all the way around. So now remember what I said about it being so even and you don't really have to mind the store quite so much, right? A lot of Americans make the mistake, a lot of people make the mistake of playing with their food too much when they cook it, right? Don't. One of the nice things about what the griddle teaches us about cooking is that if we've got it properly fit and properly seasoned, we should not play with our food. We should let the cookware or the appliance do its work. So we've done it properly. It was nice and hot. We added a small amount of oil, and now we just let these sit and brown on the surface. And while we're doing that, we're going to come over here next door to the next burner, and we're going to do a little quick saute, right? The classic saute that... Uh, we do in a French cuisine called the tomato concasse. We're gonna add a little bit of olive oil to that. And then we've got some freshly minced shallots. Just gonna add a little bit of that to our pan. We don't wanna let the oil heat up too much because we don't we want to run the risk of burning that. And the same thing is true with a little bit of minced garlic. I'm gonna add that in there as well. And we're just gonna let that come up to temperature and just start letting that get nice and hot. Now what I've got this on, it's about a medium flame, right? Which is all you really need to use. One of the important things to remember about using any one of our gas appliances, because these burners are very, very powerful, you're almost never gonna have to use the highest setting of heat. You're almost always gonna be down in that medium high, and medium range. That's gonna give you enough power. Remember that unlike the griddle, which is never gonna exceed that thermostatic temperature that we're controlling with, the pan, as it absorbs the energy from the burner, 
will continue to rise and continue to eat. So we want to moderate that heat just a little bit while we're sauteing, right? Again, it's all about that control. You can see we're getting a nice little fizzle here on that. And you just let that, and again, remember the scallops will tell you when they're ready to be turned. When they loose to a just gentle pressure, you just can easily turn them over, that's when they need to be used, but not before. You don't want to force them off. You want to let them create their own caramelization on the outside and let them go. And the griddle will do that because it will hold that temperature so evenly front to back um, and make it so you don't really have to spend too much time paying attention to them um, while they're cooking. Lynn, you have a question there from somebody watching the video? I did have a quick question. Great. Do the types of pan matter um, with the gas cooking? They matter in this case. Is that the better quality pan that you purchase? In other words, now remember that pans, good stainless steel cookware, is all basically weighted by how many plies of metal are used to create that pan. Generally, the low end is three plies, the high end is seven. The more plies you have, the more evenly it will distribute heat, right? The less opportunity there are for hot spots. That doesn't mean that you're not gonna get perfectly adequate um, results with a three ply pan, but the higher up you go, you're gonna get better results. And they'll last longer, and they always look better when they clean up. How about how can they decide if they need to turn into a griddle or a sub Well, we're lucky that we live here in Colorado and we can pretty much grill outside almost 365 days a year. So, unless you are one of those people that um, live in a place where you're really prohibited from grilling um, a lot, um, I don't necessarily um, use the char boiler quite as much. But I find the griddle to be a little more versatile um, in terms of I can use it as a warming plate. I can obviously saute and create a beautiful um, uh, some, some, sea, some seafood or chicken breast, steak. I can sear off whole uh, prime rib or beef tenderloin on here. So I like the griddle in terms of its versatility. I feel like I can get more use out of it. Um, it's not just for pancakes, it's not just for that, you know, make a really great French toast or makes a great grilled cheese sandwich. I mean, there's nothing better than uh, doing a nice grilled cheese on here because it's something even browning and you don't have to worry about the butter burning um, when you're doing it. So, so we just added some peeled, seeded, and chopped tomato to the garlic and the shallots with the olive oil. And now we're just going to let that, got a nice silver, and so turn it down nice and low and just let it simmer so it starts to release a little bit of a liquid. From the scallop while they're cooking. But as I don't know if you can see really effectively, and maybe Selena can point the camera down, but the scallops in the front are browning just like the scallops and all the zones on the griddle. So you really are getting that even, even cooking when you're using the griddle. And again, you can see that it's it's really, I don't have to play with them. I literally turn them once, and that's all I have to do. I don't have to play with my food too much. So it does give you a beautiful um, result each time when you're doing the scallop on the griddle like this. All right, so we're gonna add just a little bit of seasoning. See, there we go, that's good. So hopefully everybody's not getting too, uh, no one's getting seasick or anything like that from the camera moving. Hopefully, Selena's doing a great job and it nice and smooth, and we'll do the best that we can. Any more questions? Mm -hmm. Great. How about cleaning the griddle? So, Remember, we're treating it just like a cast iron skillet, right? We don't want to use a lot of harsh detergents on the grill. We want it, we want it to be griddle, we want it to be, we want it to retain, ooh, don't talk so fast. Um, we want it to retain its non-stick property. So, best way to clean it, get yourself one of these bench knives, kitchen knives, great for scraping all the debris off. The beautiful thing is when we scrape, the excess um, grease or food particles will come right down here as it is. A uh, little grease trap here. This can be cleaned out if you run through the dishwasher um, when you're ready to clean it. Um, that's the that's just the way to get the solids and the extra grease. But the easiest way to clean it, you want to get a couple of nice, just not disposable, but you want a couple of kitchen towels that you're not really in love with. They're not the kind of thing that you're hanging on the, the front of your dishwasher and say, look at this beautiful kitchen towel I got from. Uh, the Tower of London when I was there on my honeymoon, all of those kind of things. You don't want to use those, but just a couple that you don't really care about. 
Um, you're going to soak them down really well with clean water. And after you're done using the griddle, you're going to lay those two towels on top of one another, and it will create a beautiful steamy environment underneath it, and it will steam off any of the food that has adhered itself to the top of the griddle. Then you'll wipe it down, add a small amount of fresh of oil, the kind of oil that you use to saute or use on the grill, and then it's ready to go for the next time. There are other ways to clean it if you need to take it a little bit further. We have some chemical products that you can put on there that will clean the finish you know, right down to almost to the way it was when you got it from the factory. Um, that's one way to clean it. Um, but I, that really gets rid of that nonstick um, environment. And I, I like to keep that up. I like to keep it almost nonstick. Um, I can. So, so now when you're checking your scallops, you're just going to feel them feel like they're nice and firm, so they're nicely cooked all the way through the middle. So I'm going to come here. Go ahead. I, it's not an ideal cooking medium for the griddle just because of the, the heat that um, is being applied. It's, it's going to create um, two, almost like a sticky surface on the surface of the griddle. So you probably want to avoid using olive oil if you can. So we're going to take our, take our scallops and put them here. And don't worry, we'll take the toothpicks out. You see that's so. a All right. Apple, he's decided they wanted to stay behind. All right. Yes, another question. No? Oh, you're good. Okay. So let's just finish this up. Let's just take a quick peek behind this while we're doing that. Check and see how our cookies and our bacon are looking beautiful. I can smell them both. It looks like the bacon and the garlic can go just a little bit longer. Cookies are almost done. So we pull out all our toothpicks, finish up our garnish. And remember, if you're interested in any of these preparations, recipes, whatever it is, we're happy to share them with you. Um, even if it's just something as simple as the, the the sauce that we've made, a little basil sauce for this. So I've got some Meyer lemon preserve that we made um, in our convection steam oven. Just gonna put a little bit of that on the plate. Just give us a little brightness there. Got a little bit of basil puree that we've made. That could be an appetizer, it could be a little bit of a. So you can see how nice it could be. I'll give you a quick little demonstration on how we clean the griddle off. Again, take your scraper. You can see how easily whatever's left, whatever residue is on there, you can scrape it off. Literally, now your griddle is clear. You can move again if you do the. Um, if you do the, the towels on there, that'll take off any of the residual flavor of the scallops and the prosciutto, and then you won't taste anything when you do your pancakes on here the following morning, or some bacon, or whatever it might be that you want to cook on. So let me just pull this, pull my cookies out. So here are the macaroons coming out of the oven, nicely browned, right? You can just always check the bottom of your cookie and just see how nice they look. But we're just going to let those cool down here a little bit. Got our nice macaroons there. And then at the same time, here's our nicely toasted garlic and bacon. Got it right there. Looking good. So then we're just going to take that. And for later, what we're going to do is we're going to take our garlic and our bacon. And we are going to scrape them into this because I want to save all the flavor from the bacon fat and we've infused that flat with some garlic flavor as well. So we'll make a little fried rice later. We're going to do that using this fat and then have all these ingredients back into it. So we'll do that, we'll get that to a little bit later. All right. So we'll talk a little bit about 
dual convection, and you get a sense of why the Wolf the dual convection ovens are just so remarkable. A little bit about dual stack burners, our infrared griddle, really a wonderful feature. I, I heartily recommend one of these if you don't think you're going to use it, but once a week, maybe it's not worth the investment in the real estate, but I bet you you're going to find out other ways to use it than just pancakes on a Sunday. Why would I go for a griddle on my range versus something that I can just put on the stove while I'm cooking and then take it? Okay, great question. Um, first answer to that question is control. You can get a griddle, right, that will fit over two burners, right? And on our configuration, right, in many cases, to get burners of equal strength, same BTUs, they're going to have to run that griddle this way, right? So you're going to have to really, really be very cognizant of dialing in that temperature so that it will be at the appropriate temperature level for whatever it is you want to cook on that griddle. Remember also that as that griddle heats up, on top of the burner. It's going to continue to absorb energy, so you may have to keep playing with the heat in order to get it to hold the temperature, whether you added something and that decreases it, or you can raise it. You're gonna to have to constantly play with it. Because of the thermostat on the griddle that's built into this one, I never have to adjust that temperature once I've got it dialed in. If I know that my pancakes are ideal at 325 degrees, I'm never worried about that going high or low, it's going to maintain that temperature all the way through. And I don't have to worry about, oh, I can't cook a pancake in this corner because it's never as hot here as it is up here. It's always going to be even, so you're going to be able to utilize the entirety of the surface. It's going to be a more even cooking surface for you, and it's going to be more consistent. That's why I would say it's an advantage over one that you place. Okay. So, talk a little bit again. Dual convection, remarkable. You can see how even, no, no flavor transfer when we bake two very different things in the oven. Got a little bit of a demonstration gone here of what we can do on top of we're just scratching the surface and we'll talk a little bit about it more later. But let's kind of segue now and talk a little bit about Sub-Zero and what makes Sub-Zero the food preservation specialist. This is an important distinction to make. It's not just a refrigerator. It's a food preservation tool. We've got a little video that we're going to show you. So we're going to segue and just pop that up for you. So just take a minute or two. When quality is built into your DNA, the performance of your products is vital to your success. Sometimes it's necessary to take extreme measures when testing, and that means growing a garden in your own backyard. It's just one step in the process of becoming the food preservation specialist. These little seeds are beginning a long journey that will grow into the real story of how our food preservation begins. Using our own heirloom lettuce enables us to gather more accurate test results and highlights our ability to preserve even the most delicate foods better. By staggering the crop, planting to two week intervals, we end up with the freshest produce for our ongoing testing. Some of the grocery store varieties of lettuce are not readily available year round and details about their journey from field to store are even harder to find. Now we can control timing, weight and variety more precisely. So we load up our fresh heads of lettuce every week and take them to our test labs right next door. There, they are weighed and placed in the crispers of sub-zero refrigerators and our competitors' refrigerators. Over a two-week period, the lettuce is taken out of the crisper and weighed every three to four days. The results of that weigh-in may surprise you. The lettuce in the sub-zero crisper lost only 9% of its weight over the two-week period. The lettuce in our closest competitors' crispers 
they lost a whopping 36% over those same 14 days. If you do the math, the choice is simple. Sub-Zero refrigerators are the food preservation specialists. So, so anyway, just um, beautiful pictures there of, uh, sorry, we're getting a little feedback. <laughs> uh, here in Denver, it would be nice. But, uh, but uh, anyway, but get a sense of what Sub-Zero is all about and how important testing is to this um, American company. You know, this company has been in business since 1947. It's always been based there in Madison. Everything is built in the United States. It's three generation family owned. Um, so we're very proud of that fact uh, that, we, that we do assemble and build everything here in the United States, whether it's in Madison or a, a, our sister plant down in Douglas, Arizona. We build all of our refrigeration here uh, and we get a sense about what makes Sub-Zero such a special appliance. There's just a couple things I want to point out with you that make us a little bit different from many of our competitors. And the first thing is, is that we have a dual refrigeration system in every single unit that we make. So when you have a side-by-side -side, um, refrigerator freezer unit, there isn't one refrigeration system that is, is using um, the air to share between both of those compartments. We have one dedicated just for the freezer and one dedicated just for the refrigerator. Now, why this is important is because obviously the humidity that we have in our refrigerated section of our um, unit has got to be much higher humidity at a much warmer temperature in order to promote the longevity of your fresh vegetables, your meats, your deli cheeses. All of those things are affected very, very heavily by humidity, right? So if the humidity is too low, you're going to dry out those products because there's going to be a higher humidity in the product and that humidity is going to bleed off into the air and now your food is going to dry out and it's going to go bad much faster, right? So we need that humidity to be very high when we're in our refrigerated section. But conversely, if we're in the freezer section, we need the humidity to be lower because obviously if the humidity is too high in the freezer, we get freezer burn and we end up with that Oh my goodness, what's in this Ziploc bag? It could be a pork chop, it could be a salmon filet, it could be pie dough, we're not really sure, right? So we want to reduce that. So by reducing the amount of humidity in the freezer by its having its own separate system of refrigeration, that humidity is lower and therefore we have much less freezer burn, much longer shelf life for items that are in the freezer as well. So that dual refrigeration is so very important to the longevity of your food. And that's why we call this a food preservation tool. It's not just a refrigerator. It's something that really makes your food last longer. And if your food is lasting longer, you're gonna be more likely to consume it because it's gonna look better longer. So you're gonna to wanna to eat it, right? Most of us know, right? That we, we, we have those moments where we go in and we look at the strawberries and we think, oh Lord, I bought these a week ago and already they're, they're more white or blue than they were red because they've gone moldy, they've just gone bad. They don't have that long a shelf life in a normal refrigerator, right? But in a Sub-Zero, we can almost guarantee that that food is going to last two times as long, three times as long, could be even longer. One of my refrigerators upstairs, I keep all my dairy in that refrigerator. I have literally had liquid milk dairy go six weeks beyond its expiration date before it began to even begin to smell like it was going off, right? Six weeks beyond the expiration date for milk, right? Which most of us, you know, we get to that expiration date on milk and we're like, oh, that's going in the sink right away because we're afraid that it's gonna be, you know, it's gonna be really smelly and not very good. So we can almost guarantee because we keep that 
humidity at the proper level. We keep the temperature within 0.75 of a degree of the set point in either direction. There's only a one and a half degree area of fluctuation in the temperature in both your freezer and your refrigerator at all times. Because that's really one of those things that causes food to go bad is when the temperature of the refrigerator is doing this, it's going high, it's going low, it's going high. That food is going into that flux and that's what causes it to spoil even faster. Again, a food preservation tool, right? Take it one step further. Now, how many of you right now could get up and tell me where in your home the manual to your refrigerator is? My guess is that some of you are really good about filing it. You know exactly where it is. You can go grab it right away and say it. But the nice thing about a Sub-Zero is we put the manual for the refrigerator in the refrigerator. And it's right here on these cards. And they come with all of our Sub-Zero units. You're going to get these two cards. They're going to fit into a slot in your refrigerator. One of them is literally the manual that describes on the card all the symbols that will show up in your LED screen that tells you what the ice maker is doing, if it needs maintenance, when the filters need changing, all of those things. They're right here. They're listed by the icons. It also has a color-coded set of zones that will show you the best possible place to store the different types of food in that refrigerator. Lynn, you had a question? Yes. Um, should you rinse and wash your vegetables right as soon as you get them prior to putting them in your refrigerator? I don't. I like to keep the moisture off, especially with leafy vegetables and things like that. You don't want to put that extra moisture in there because um, that wetness will cause a little bit of, you know, it'll, it's not really good for it. The beauty of the Sub-Zero, again, especially with vegetables, they're in our high humidity drawers. All of our drawers, our produce drawers, are designed to be even higher humidity than the the rest of the unit. So when we have leafy lettuce, when we have celery, when we have something like that that we want to keep nice and crisp, we want to keep it in a very high humidity zone. You guys probably have that little slider thing on your, uh, on your, your bins right now. Do you really think that by moving that, you're changing the humidity level in your crisper drawer? Probably not. But the beauty of a, of a Sub-Zero's crisper drawer, like the one we have here at the bottom, that has this very tight-fitting, high-humidity lid on top of it, and it seals incredibly tightly, so that extra humidity that's being pumped into that drawer is staying in that drawer, keeping your vegetables fresh. And to that, the second card that you get with your manual that comes in your, your Sub-Zero is your food freshness card. And what this is, is essentially a, a guide that will tell you how long you should expect your food to last in your Sub-Zero from when you bring it home. So most people, strawberries, maybe they get a week, maybe they get three days before they start to get soft and essentially inedible. In a Sub-Zero, we look up strawberries and look for them on our Sub-Zero our sheets. Excuse me, on this side, it's seven to 10 days is what you minimum can expect those strawberries to last. A head of lettuce, it's at least a week. I've had lettuce go, go as long as a month before I need to actually throw it away. But in most cases, after four to six weeks, I can just peel off a couple of the outer leaves and the rest of the lettuce is perfectly fine to consume and I don't worry about that. So this food preservation card comes with your Sub-Zero and now you can gauge how long something's gonna last and what we like to say is that in the first year of ownership, right, that you have a Sub-Zero, we can cut the amount of food that you throw away because it goes bad due to your inadequate refrigeration by half. So if you're throwing away what the average American family throws away, which is about $2,000 a year worth of food, in the first year we'll cut that by $1,000 and then as your buying habits change and your storage habits change, you'll probably reduce that number even further and you'll throw away less and less food. Question Lynn? How about anything freezing on the top shelf? Mm -hmm. No, we, we don't have that with the way that the air is distributed, the way it's pushed in. We don't have that sharing of air from the freezer, right? So in other words, that in many units, you're taking the very cold air from the freezer, you're warming it just a little bit to try to move it to the refrigerator, but it's still gonna be very low moisture and it's going to be much, much colder. So you get those spots in your refrigerator where the air is being pushed into the, into the unit where things freeze. In this case, because it has its own dedicated refrigeration system, you're never going to have that problem. The air that's being put into your refrigerator is going to be calibrated 
to the exact temperature and humidity required for the refrigeration unit. So you're not going to get that spot where the lettuce freezes in the back of the crisper or the top corner where you have the mustard or the mayonnaise that might get a little ice crystal on top. That's not going to happen because that air coming into that unit is never going to be that cold. Right? So just that's one of the ways that Sub-Zero helps preserve your food by keeping the humidity level consistent, the temperature level consistent between the freezer and the refrigerator. So we're not worried about that. But think about this too. What's the other thing you really notice a lot of times when you open your refrigerator, right? If you left a, 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 a pan of cooked salmon and you didn't cover it, the whole refrigerator smells like fish and you're thinking, oh great, now anything else that was in there is going to start to smell like salmon because you know the, the rest of the refrigerator smells like salmon. Excuse me, one second, I'm just going to stand up for a second. So, and how do we cope with that? Well, the, the average, most people, they throw a box of baking soda in there and they, that's going to absorb those odors and now I, I'll be okay and, you know, I'll just live with it, right? Well, Sub-Zero thought, maybe that's not the best way to do it. You know, we have nothing against the baking soda people, but we've got to come up with a better way to reduce odors and bacteria and mold and mildew that might be living in our refrigerator. So we came up with an air, an air filtration system, which we like to call the pure air system. And this was developed um, in conjunction, actually the, the technology was developed at the University of Wisconsin, um, working with the NASA to create an air filtration system for the International Space Station. Um, and then the people at Sub-Zero said, hey, you know, maybe we can adapt that and put it into one of our refrigerator units so we can clean the air in the refrigerator. So all of your Sub-Zero refrigerators come with one of these air filters. Um, and the way this air filter works is we have a box with some titanium dioxide crystals. You can hear them in there. There's also a little tiny UV light in this unit as well. Every 20 minutes, the UV light turns on. We pull the entire contents of air from the refrigerator through this filter. So it's going passing over the titanium dioxide, being hit with the UV light, and voila, no odors, no mildew, no bacteria, no mold. All of it's cleaned out and stored in this filter every 20 minutes. Now, I dare say this is slightly more sophisticated than a box of baking soda. Also, much more effective in that way because it's cleaning the air. So things were going to last longer because that's why sometimes cheese goes bad. You put a piece of cheese in there, cheese is a living thing. When other mold spores land on your cheese, they say, hoo hoo, something to eat. And the next thing you know, your cheese is turning all sorts of colors you don't want it to turn. And that's because that mold is floating around inside. But this filter cleans that out. So now that's going to last longer. Right? Lynn. How long do our appliances last, including our refrigerator? Okay, so the, we build everything we make, whether it's a refrigerator, a dishwasher, a range, an oven, doesn't matter. We expect 20 years minimum out of any one of our appliances, which is why we have very, very long warranties. In fact, some of the uh, internal components on your Sub-Zero have a 12-year warranty, right? So if one of the major closed components fails, your compressor, your evaporator fails on your Sub-Zero, all you pay for is the labor to replace it. The part is, all, is covered for 12 years. Um, we have customers who come to us and say, you know, my Sub-Zero, it's working great. It's 35 years old. Um, it just looks a little dated. That's why we're updating it, but it still works just fine. So you can expect very, very long lives out of everything we build. Um, the fact that we, right out of the chute, warrantied our dishwasher for five years when the average um, dishwasher warranty is a year. Right? And in most cases, but we really believe that our dishwashers um, are the best built in the market today. Um, and so we, we, we stand behind that with all of our warranties. So you can, Pretty much expect 20 years of continued service from all of your all of your sub-zero and wolf appliances. Right? So let's just finish up a little bit more about um, the refrigeration process before we move on to our convection steam oven. Again, this is our Pro 48. It's one of our nicest top of the line models. Um, and one of the things that I just admire about this unit, along its 100% stainless steel, as you can see, it has 
two upper doors. It has four drawers down below. Um, when you get a chance to come into the showroom, if you just want to get a sense of the craftsmanship that goes behind one of these units, um, open the doors, open the doors, feel the seams, look for an exposed screw head, an unfinished well, anything like that, you're never going to find. You're never going to find something where you might catch your nails on it and cut your fingers or break your nail. You're going to find that it's beautifully, beautifully crafted and finished. And that's one of the reasons also that it lasts for so long because they are melted made to such exacting specifications that it really is uh, it's more of a work of art than it is just an appliance. So something you would be really proud of to have in your home, whether it's this unit or any of the other Sub-Zero units. Um, just real testament to it. So that, that's just a little bit about how we can extend the life of the food in your kitchen. Would save you some money in terms of how you're buying food um, because you're going you're gonna to know that it's going to have a much longer shelf life in that Sub-Zero than it would in a normal refrigerator. So, a little bit there, so any more questions about sub -Zero? I do, I have a couple questions here and there. Sure. How often will I be changing that filter? About once a year. Um, you're gonna find that the, the refrigerator will tell you when the air filter needs to be changed. Um, it's about a $40 purchase, um, but again, it'll last for a full year, it may go longer, but um, on average, it's about once a year. Um, kind of switching over to cooking really quickly. Sure. Do you do anything to condition the stovetop grates, or are they? No, nope, you don't need to. The stovetop grates are just built from a, a slightly different alloy um, than our um, our infrared griddle is. Um, you don't really need to condition them. Just wash them in the sink with some soapy water. Um, that's all it really takes uh, to get them clean. Um, the maintenance is, is, you know, I'm not going to say it's it's nothing, but yeah, I think it's it's fairly minimal. Do you always use convection when you're baking or cooking? No, no. And one of the beauties of what we offer here at Roth, um, for those of you who go ahead and decide to uh, make um, the investment in our appliances, that we will invite you to our ownership experience. Hopefully, at some point when you have yours installed, we'll be doing them live and in person, and you'll be here in the showroom. So we'll be able to, uh, to, to answer your questions one-on-one. -on -one. Um, for those ownership experiences, but what we're going to do for that is we're going to train you about all the different ways that you can use the modes in your oven to cook. So when do you use convection and why do you use convection? When do you use bake versus convection bake? When might you want to use convection broil versus a standard broil? All of those things. So we're going to give you some training so that you're not going in there just kind of feeling your way through it. You're going to understand why we have 10 modes on our oven and why those modes are there and how to use them. So yes, we're going to, you don't want to use convection for everything, but we're going to teach you when you need to use it you know, to its greatest effectiveness. Anything else? Um, we had some questions about the difference between wall oven and steam oven. Sure. I feel like you're about we're about to, to get onto that. that. That's <laughs> right, that's right. Okay. So if there's nothing more about Sub-Zero, and again, if you have more questions for the end, Please don't worry. We'll answer them um, when you know when you when when you pose them to us. So we'll give you as much time as you need to ask questions. So the convection steam oven, perhaps uh, the most I don't want to say popular, but it's certainly one of those appliances that everybody's talking about right now because we're understanding the benefits of using steam with which to not only roast and and, and, and steam food, but also to bake and what steam can do for us in that aspect of our cookery, right? So the convection steam oven is an appliance that comes direct, I mean directly out of the food service industry. For years and years and years, the only place you could find that combination steam oven was in large banqueting hotels and convention centers and things like that because they were preparing huge meals for you know thousands of people they need to do them well in advance but they also wanted to hold that food in a safe environment while not drying it out keeping it beautiful and moist and really you know first class um, preparation but they need to do it for lots of people so they developed a technology that would utilize the combination of steam and convection fans in order to promote the ability to prepare large amounts of food and hold it for prolonged periods of time some very intelligent person thought, you know what, that might be a great thing for the home chef. Let's see if we can make it a little bit smaller. And so I would say probably somewhere between 10 and 20 years ago, 
convection steam technology started showing up in residential applications, primarily in Europe to begin with, um, but now it's come across to the United States and we're really adapting it um, to the American um, home uh, in terms of what you can do with it. And now why is steam gonna be beneficial? Well, right now you're all thinking to yourself, well, of course steam, higher moisture, so if I'm keeping something more moist, it's gonna, you know, it's gonna be better in the end and if we want it to be nice and succulent and juicy, we wanna use that, we wanna use steam to help promote that moisture retention in the food that we're cooking. Remember too that steam is a far more efficient medium for transferring heat than dry air is. And a good example of that would be if I have something in the oven back here, the M series oven, say I'm baking it, well, like these macaroons, right? And I wanna remove those macaroons from the oven, I can easily just open the oven door, reach in with a towel or a hot pad and take out that um, pan of cookies without any damage to my own person. But if I have a pot of water on the stove and it's boiling rapidly and all that steam is flowing off of there, I don't put my arm across that because I'm going to get scalded very badly and it's going to burn me. Now remember, this is a 375 degree oven. This is essentially 210 degree steam. But the fact that it's burning me much more efficiently than that 375 degrees much more quickly, we see that that heat transfer is much more efficient. So steam, when it's applied to food, starts cooking it immediately. And the benefit of the moisture while we're cooking is going to accelerate and keep that product moist. So we're spending less time in the oven. We're using steam to keep it moist. So that makes the steam combination cooking devices far more efficient and therefore really beneficial to your cooking. So don't just think of it as a steamer. You want to think of it not only as a steamer, but as a regular convection oven. If I'm just going to bake a quick tray of biscuits or maybe I want to do a quick souffle, right? I can use this oven to do that. It's, not, it's a little bit smaller, heats up very quickly, less preheat time, you know, faster for our busy schedules. We want something that's gonna you know, respond very, very quickly. But then it has the combination modes. It uses a combination of steam and dry air in order to cook things in exact amounts of time, using steam to cook it more efficiently and then giving me you know, a more moist product in the end, right? So that combination of steam and dry air is really what sets it apart from other um, appliances. Do right? you have a question? Was there a question? Um, so, um, convection steam oven, as you can see, it's mounted here above our M-series oven. You can think of it just like a regular oven. In fact, many of our clients now are coming in and one of the first questions they have is, do I need the traditional sort of double wall oven set up in my new kitchen? And what we like to tell them is that, you know, you probably don't need two big ovens that often. You may need it at the holidays. You might like the idea of having two large sized ovens if you're doing a lot of entertaining or you have a big family, things like that. Um, but for the average family, having a setup much like this, where you have a traditional 30 inch wall oven or range oven, right? And then you add a convection steam oven, now you have an oven that you're probably going to want to use, I don't know, seven times out of 10, this is going to be the oven you're going to use because very infrequently do you need to preheat the oven, right? You're not preheating, you're not waiting for it to preheat, the food goes in, you turn it on, off you go, it's cooking, right? It's going to cook much faster, it's easier to clean, a little bit less maintenance. Um, all of those things make it an advantage when you're thinking about a double oven setup somewhere in your kitchen. So. This smaller oven, which is basically the same footprint as a standard um, wall microwave, right, is going to give you um, a lot more versatility um, in your kitchen when you use it as one of your two ovens. Now, the other question that we get a lot about convection steam is, okay, what can't it do, right? What, what can the microwave do that this can't, right? So the only things you can do, you can't do in this oven, that you can do in the microwave, pop popcorn, reheat your coffee, Right? Those are the two things that you definitely can't do. And there's no broiler in here, which obviously most microwaves don't have a broiler, but you can't broil in this oven. So if you want to melt some cheese on top of your French onion soup, this is not the oven to do that in because there is no broiler. But aside from the coffee and the popcorn thing, <laughs> this oven can do just about everything a microwave can do. And in many cases, while it won't do it as quickly as a microwave, it'll do a better job. So reheating your leftovers, Refreshing a loaf of bread. You go and 
buy a beautiful loaf of bread or maybe you bake a loaf of bread and you don't eat the whole thing but you want to refresh it a couple days later you can pop it in a convection steam oven for about seven minutes and that bread is like you just baked it in fact and selena will just hand over here these two loaves of bread that are just sitting here on the counter were baked today in the convection steam oven and really it's literally pressing two buttons and then you can bake a loaf of bread that looks just like that so it's really simple and now i know everybody's home and they're Become the sourdough kings of their neighborhood or whatever it might be, the queens, excuse me. And they've gone out there and they've started baking those things, but they and they have to do the whole thing with the Dutch oven and they're doing all that kind of stuff, which is a great way to bake a loaf of bread. But if I can tell you you can get this by pressing two buttons and not having to preheat the oven to get that result, I think you take it in a heartbeat because you can make that sourdough without having to go through quite the gymnastics in your kitchen um, to do that. So um, a great example of how this convection steam oven works um, is what we've prepared for today. We've done some Korean style barbecued pork spare ribs. We've done them in the convection steam oven. We use that convection steam mode. So we're getting the nice moisture from the um, convection steam setting um, at a lower temperature, about 265 degrees. We've let the, the ribs cook for about an hour and a half, maybe a little bit less, um, but you can just see there's the steam coming out of the oven, looking beautiful. And here's our ribs that have just been steamed and they're beautiful, moist and succulent. You can just see right there, got those lovely ribs um, done. Um, and I've done everything from pulled pork, pot roast, lamb shanks, you can braise in this oven, you can do just about anything you want. And it's not just good for meat, it's great for baking, right? Everybody thinks, oh, you know, what's steam going to be good for with baking? We all know that when we're baking a loaf of bread, steam really helps us set a beautiful crust when we're making the, on a loaf of bread. But it also works really nicely for, you want to reheat your pizza? Then you got a, 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 you know, yesterday's pizza that you ordered from the pizzeria down the street? Throw it in here, put it on convection steam, 365 degrees for about four minutes. It's like that pizza just came out of the oven when you first ordered it. It's not going to be dry. That cheese is not going to have that weird translucence to it, um, which I never appreciate. It has a kind of a rubbery texture. In this oven, when you reheat your pizza like that, it's just going to be phenomenal. Um, so just think of it that way. It's not just for doing beautiful roasts and all that kind of stuff. Um, it can do just miraculous things for baking a bunt cake or doing a batch of chocolate chip cookies, whatever it is. Um, you're going to get great results. It's, um, using the CSO, the convection steam oven, for doing just that. So um, we will go ahead and present these in just a second, and let's just uh, finish up. So um, that's a little bit about convection steam. you have some questions about the convection steam oven then? I've got a couple miscellaneous questions. Miscellaneous questions are always good. So. <laughs> we know there's no 48-inch range that has a steam oven. That is correct. That is correct. All of our, all of our ranges come with a standard um 30 inch on the 48 you're going to get a 30 inch standard dual convection oven um, and then you're going to get a small it is also convection um not dual it's not enough room for two fans and an 18 inch oven side by side but there is not the steam option built in to your um, range oven. how about cleaning out the racks and the shelving how about cleaning them? Mm -hmm. So the racks themselves or the, the entire cavity? So all of our, um, all of the um, wall ovens and the dual fuel range ovens come with a self-cleaning mode. So those were, you would remove all the racks in order to run that to clean the cavity itself. Um, ideally, the best way to clean the racks, and this would be true not just for the wolf racks, but for any oven rack. Uh, there's a product on the market called... Um, uh, it's car it's a uh, carbon off um, rack cleaner um, and literally you just literally put the racks in a giant ziploc bag you throw that mixture into that you seal it up you let it sit overnight um, and then the next morning you just rinse them off and it'll clean your rack uh, beautifully um, and it makes it shiny and brand new but that's the best way I found that scrubbing it down um, that, that can be very very difficult um, so um, that carbon that rack um, carbon off works really nicely So we're just going to do a quick little stir fry of uh, some rice here. We've got some rice, and just so you know, this uh, this 
beautiful white rice was steamed in the convection steam oven. Um, we just used that rice setting for cooking the rice in the oven itself. Um, and it steams it beautifully. You don't, you don't have to uh, worry about it. It just comes out really, really nicely. So it saves you that so little, little cooking tip, regardless of how you're cooking your rice, you should always make sure that you rinse your rice at least two or three times in some cold changes of water um, before you set it in the pot or the convection steam oven or however you cook it. Always advisable to rinse the rice um, before you cook it, and that will give you a better quality product of rice. A lot of people make that mistake. They don't rinse their rice, and then they wonder why their rice is mushy or all of those things. So rinse it two or three times. Any more questions? No? Nothing yet? All right, so we're just going to do a little bit of stir fry here. So while this is stir frying, we've obviously got that on a pretty high temperature. I want to show you an example of just how much control you get on your wolf dual stack burns, right? The entire time that we've been here doing this presentation, and actually even before, there's been a pot sitting on the stove, and in that pot, um, and, the, and the burner is on, right? And in that pot are some little pistols of dark chocolate. And they've been sitting there the entire time. And I just want to show you, like I said, it's been on the whole time, right? But you can still see that there is a little bit of texture. You can still see some of the things, but the chocolate is completely not scorched, not burned. And it can literally sit here indefinitely. You could let it sit at this burner setting without ever worrying about scorching the chocolate, you know, burning the bottom of the pan. You'll never have that problem because the control that the, that the burner provides, it's never going to allow that to happen. You're always going to have immaculate control over this. And so this chocolate will stay beautifully melted just like that for as long as you want it to just sitting on that burn. So control is what it's really all about with gas cooking. Ability to have that at your disposal can always make you a better cook because you're not worried about scorching or burning or whatever it might be. And that way, oh, that wasn't very good. And I see now I have to clean that up. So, just like this rice a little bit more. And then to that rice, we're just gonna add some fresh scallions, And then here's the uh, the garlic and the bacon, right? I'm gonna stir that back in. Because you know what could be better than that? I'm gonna stir that with our ribs. All right. Any more questions yet? No. No questions yet. All right. Curbside pickup. That's a great idea. <laughs> that was the, that, I'll be honest with everybody, that was the thing we couldn't try to, we were trying to figure out how could we, because we don't, obviously, uh, there's that old joke about smell of vision and we don't have that, and so you can't smell the, the garlic cooking or the, the ribs or anything like that. Um, we were trying to figure out what was the best way that we could involve people uh, uh, in, in actually getting to sample the food, and we never were able to come up with that, uh, that solution. So. Shoot. Um, kind of talking about the connectivity. Do the does the refrigeration have any Wi-Fi capability or any other? Great question. Great question. So many of our appliances do have the connectivity feature. All of our refrigerators have the ability to connect to Wi-Fi. So you can check not only the life of your filters, but um, if the door has been left open, whether the alarm is going off. All of those are things you can adjust the temperature, all of that on your refrigerator. Many of our wall ovens, the M series wall ovens, have the ability to connect to the internet. So you can make sure that when it's preheated, it'll give you an alert. You can check your timer from a distance, all of those things. In the morning, you can connect with the oven, and then while you're at work during the day um, and you need to turn your oven on to preheat, you can do that from your phone and it'll start preheating your oven so that when you get 
home, it's all ready to go. So the wall ovens are that way as well. Um, right now, the convection steam oven does not have the ability to connect. Neither, obviously, do the burners on the range, but many of those are, our dishwashers also have the ability to connect to the um, to the internet as well. So those are all Wi-Fi enabled. Can you defrost in the convection steam oven? Another great question. So the range on the convection steam oven, right, for the steam mode goes as low as 90 degrees Fahrenheit and up to 210. So between 90 and 110 degrees is an ideal temperature for defrosting meats, uh, seafood, uh, excuse me, frozen pastries, things like that at a low temperature with a lot of moisture so you're not going to um, end up cooking the product, but it'll defrost really, really nicely in a very safe environment. So yes, you can defrost very, very efficiently, much better than in a microwave where you're worried about that little bit of weirdness cooking around the outside or maybe the middle gets a little bit kind of spongy when it's done like that. But in the convection steam oven, you never have to worry about it. Take a little bit longer, but much safer and uh, a very efficient, efficient way to, to, uh, to defrost. Yes. Give you a sense of just how beautiful and moist these ribs are. Um, just up close, they just really are beautiful and moist inside. Very tender off the bone. Um, obviously, um, just a great way to do ribs. You don't have to add any moisture to them. All the moisture is provided by the oven itself. So it's a great way to be able to do some ribs quickly um, and with very, very little effort on your part. Questions? Yeah. So the steam oven, it says to only use tap water. Mm -hmm. Cook stop and water out of its tap. That's okay. Tap. Soft water is fine. Now the oven, when you get it installed, when you install the oven, you're going to be asked to set um, the water hardness setting um, for your particular oven. Um, and you're going to get a little test kit uh, when you bring it home. And you're going to test the water out of your tap. You're then going to put the corresponding number into your oven, and that will allow you to um, descale at the proper um, time frame um, and it, uh, the proper frequency. Um, so it'll it'll work really really efficiently uh, when you're doing that. So yes, you can just use tap water; it doesn't need to be soft. The only the only prohibition on water from the tap you have to worry if you have an RO system, if you have a reverse osmosis whole home system in your house, um, you can still use your tap water. But you're probably going to have to add about a tablespoon of San Pellegrino or Perrier or Evian. Just put a tablespoon of that water into the into the uh, into the reservoir when you're steaming, and then your oven will function just perfectly. You won't have to worry at all. So yeah, that's the only prohibition on the water. You just need a little bit of that tap uh, minerality. Marinated cucumbers to go with our ribs and our, our fried rice, and then we're going to take our macaroons, our coconut and apple macaroons. Just going to do a little drizzle of the chocolate that we melted on top of our cookies. go. Right. So, um, uh, questions, anything else that uh, people have? Uh, yeah. Right. So at this point, if you'd like to unmute your microphone, if you want to ask some more questions, if you have some other things that you couldn't get into the chat future, we're definitely here to answer your questions. Lynn and myself and certainly Selena, we can answer all of your questions. Um, so if you have a question about making an appointment or perhaps some design ideas, don't ask me about your design because I don't know anything about design. I know only about the cooking part, um, but I'm happy to answer those as well. Um, and we're sorry that you can't sit down and enjoy this with us, but again, um, we're here to answer your questions and I uh, hope you've enjoyed this presentation this evening. Um, it's given you a little more insight into um, what is, I think, really unique and wonderful about our appliances and what they can do 
for you at home and the fact that they'll last you forever. It seems like it's, uh, it's, uh, it, it's just, uh, it's been fun doing this and uh, let's uh, answer some more questions. No more questions? No more questions. Just eating? People want to eat. I guess it's time for dinner at home. Now they're hungry and they, they want to get to their own kitchen. Or How I have a question. Again? So we will send them out. I will send out a, an email next week. Um, once I've got all the recipes in one place, I'll send out to everybody who is on today's call. Um, we'll be happy to send those and share those with you. They'll come to you digitally um, from my personal address here at Roth. Um, so again, if you have questions or you need other recipe questions answered, I'm always available to, uh, to answer those for you. So you can just reach out to me and I'm happy to do that um, for you. And again, if you're interested in uh, making an appointment to do a, a tour of the showroom or meet with one of our um, fabulous consultants here at the showroom, um, you can just give us a call 303-373-9090. Um, um, you can just give us a call or you can send us an email um, at rsvpdenver at Roth the DEM, so you are RSVPDEN at RothLiving.com, and we'll be happy to set you up with an appointment so that you can join us here in the showroom and uh, and uh, have a look at the, the appliances first. So, I have a question. Unless anybody has any other questions, yes, I do. I do. How do we get the glass on the inside of my oven is very dirty? Any tips to clean that? Again. The glass on the interior. Of on the interior of the glass on your either your M series or your yes. uh, convection steam oven, whichever okay. it is easiest way to clean it. While the oven is still warm, as it's cooled down just a little bit, I like to make a paste out of baking soda and white white vinegar. I rub it on the inside of the glass. Just make it all the way over. Just just rub it on there with a towel. Then I have a very narrow, thin, flat razor in a holder. I scrape it horizontally across the face of the glass just to clean off anything that might be cooked onto it. It also scrapes off that baking soda mixture. Then I wipe it with a clean um, wet towel. And then last thing to do is I kind of polish it by using some, uh, some non-ammoniated window cleaner on the inside and then just wipe that off on the glass part. But using that razor flat against the glass will cake off any carbonized or caramelize any food or sugars or anything that are on the glass um, and the baking soda and the vinegar help clean it off as well. Thank you. I find the top rack and the bottom rack with the clips are very difficult to move. They're hard to remove in your M series? Yeah. And okay, if you don't um, remember to do it before it's hard, it's really Maybe Selena can move the, uh, the, the, the camera so you can see into the oven. Um, and I, I don't know if you're assume, if you're if you're talk, if it's if it's catching as it slides like this if you're finding that it's catching um, on the on the exterior racks um, what I recommend you do is take those exterior racks you can remove them from the oven if that's difficult they should just lift off on their little keyhole um, attachments take the the finest sandpaper you can find um, it's usually like a two thousand grit or a three thousand grit. And just very finely rub on the side racks with that. That'll keep it from catching. If you're having trouble removing them from the oven, when you have the racks that are on the glides, right, to remove them, it is most easily done by extending the rack all the way out so that it's like this, gripping it near the back, and then lifting up and pulling it straight out. So in an extended fashion is the easiest way to remove them. The reverse is true for putting the rack into the oven. Close the rods all the way, hold them nice and firmly. You see this part right here, this is the little glide or guide that guides mm -hmm. the rack into the oven. Tilt it at about a 30 to 40 degree angle. Tip it so that those two little glides are on the rack and then just push it through and then just like that. And again, if it's sticking, when you're pulling this one out, and this is the these are the racks that don't have the glides and there's no ball bearing glide in there. 
if it's sticking and it's hard to remove, it could be that one of the little keyholes is not completely attached, so it's protruding into the oven a little bit, which is making it stick. Or if they ever, um, if for any reason they ran through a cleaning cycle, sometimes the metal on those side racks gets a little coarse from the intense heat of the cleaning cycle. So by using that sandpaper trick on that, it'll make it slide much more smoothly in the future. But again, to remove that ball bearing rack, extend it all the way, lift it from the back of the rack, and it'll come out more easily. Then close them to replace it in the oven. Thank you. Welcome. You're very welcome. What oven, this is from Sonia, what oven do you use um, most often with your recipes that you generally make? So since I've come to work at, um, at Roth and been working with um, the Sub-Zero Wool products, I probably use my convection steam oven about 75% of the time. Um, the real limiting factor on the convection steam oven is going to be size. I can only put up to about a 20 pound turkey in here. Anything larger, I can't fit in this oven, but I have fit a full size prime rib in this oven. So the size limitation is fairly minimal. Um, you can't do as many racks at once. If you have big items um, in here and you wanna do multiples of those, um, you can't do that in this oven, but um, more often than not, I'm defaulting to the convection steam oven just because I'm doing a single item or something like that. It's gonna be more efficient, it's gonna be faster, it's gonna be able to use the steam. So I'm always, always, always defaulting to this one and size back or, or whenever I'm baking multiple racks of something, multiple racks of cookies, multiple racks of biscuits, something like that, I'm always going to use my M series oven or my dual fuel range oven because that convection system is more sophisticated than the convection system in this oven. So if I'm just wanting to do multi-rack baking, I'm always going to go to my M series because that's where I'm going to get the most even and consistent results in multi rack baking. Um, if you're using the steam oven, yes. um, steam convection, uh -huh. um, do you usually you usually use convection steam? Is that your most common mode? Convection steam is you're going to use it the most in the sense that because it has the widest range of applications, right? Convection steam at high temperatures is going to be the mode you're going to use to brown off a roasted chicken, to roast a batch of fingerling potatoes to give you beautifully crispy golden brown potatoes. It's going to do all of that at a high temperature. It's going to be brown, caramelization, texture, all that flavor is going to come with convection steam at a high temperature. Obviously, you're also using steam, so it's cooking faster and cooking with more moisture, so the product's gonna come out better. But at a low temperature, convection steam can mimic a water bath for making a cheesecake, custard, creme brulee, anything like that. We use a convection steam system at 225 degrees. Now it's essentially like cooking in a water bath, right? But I don't need to use a water bath, I can just use the steam in the oven, and now the convection steam oven gives me that range. So convection steam, I would say, yes, is the mode that you're going to use most often when you're just doing some sort of general product, um, just general ideas. But if you're going to bake cookies, you might want to use our convection humid mode because now the oven is not producing steam, but it's not releasing any of the moisture that the food itself is producing. So it stays more moist. So a bundt cake, uh, muffins, uh, brownies, all of those things will stay nice and moist because none of the moisture that those items are produced during baking is being released from the oven, so it captures the moisture and it's really nice. In fact, Lynn's mother mentioned to me yesterday um, when we were doing a little demonstration, that's her favorite mode um, on the is the uh, is the uh, convection humid mode. She uses it most often when baking, so very efficient mode for baking. Any more questions? Any more questions? Well, let me just say good evening to everybody and thank you so much for joining us. I hope this has been instructional for you and informative. Again, reach out should you have any questions to those of us here in the showroom. We're happy to be of assistance. Um, and again, I hope everybody stays safe and happy all the time. And again, you can email um, me personally um, or just the, the RSVP, D-E-N, 
at rothliving.com if you have any general questions for the showroom. Um, 